Welcome back, everyone. We'll now turn to our panel on sustaining the biocultural diversity of our mountain regions, which is going to be a discussion that will look at how a two-eyed seeing approach, which sees through one eye with the lens of Indigenous knowledge and through the other lens of science, which we talked uh, about in our last panel, um, and how that is needed to meet our international biological and cultural diversity obligations and to restore our relationships with each other and the earth, particularly in the context of our mountain regions. So we have three panelists today. And first panelist is um, Eli, who is the new Chalmuth Canadian political scientist who has focused in constitutional law, international dispute resolution, and ecological governance. Co-founder of the Hakamin Tribal Park, I'm sorry if that pronunciation is incorrect, in Clayoquit Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Eli is the grandson of Nawalsam, public speaker and historian for the Wiccanish. A proud father of five, Eli holds himself accountable to future ancestors and invests his time in several related capacities. Committee member, Canadian Commission for the UNESCO Man and Biosphere National Committee, Director of Plenty Canada, Business Development Liaison for Ecotrust Canada, and as the North American Regional Coordinator for the Indigenous Peoples and Community Conserved Territories and Area Consortium. Through the natural education provided by his elders, Eli has gained an appreciation for the profound simplicity of Hikush. Okay, I totally messed that one up. Sawag, <laughs> where everything is one and interconnected. Hopefully, Eli, you can expand upon that and um, correct my um, terrible pronunciation. And this concept, he is applying this perspective in his life and work through the pursuit of the common ground, alternative pathways to economic certainty, environmental stewardship, and assertion of Aboriginal rights and title building on experience in a variety of community development areas at the Tietinius Equilibrium Community Development Site in the Pacific Rim National Park Reserve and at the Opisat in the Mears Island Tribal Park. Eli has developed an Indigenous Watershed Management Area Program, which aims to complement an ecological governance approach with a well thought out ecological economics component. Mm. Our next panelist is Dr. Pamela Shaw, who is a 2018 3M teaching fellow, geography professor, director of, of the Master of Community Planning Program, research director of the UNESCO Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Research Institute, senior editor of the International Journal of the UNESCO Biosphere Reserves, senior editor of VIU Victoria University Press, and a fellow with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. She's also an elected member of the Board of the Directors for the Canadian Institute of Planning and Vice President of the Canadian Biosphere Reserve Association. Pam has won multiple awards for teaching and is known for creatively engaging students in an applied community-based approach. Many projects have developed in partnership with First Nations on Vancouver Island with the research uh, questions shaped by the nation to address practical issues. Pam's current research focuses on the human nature relationship in biosphere regions as these regions are intended to serve as model sites for how people can coexist with nature. And third on our panel, we have Norma Cassie from the Canadian Mountain Network. Norma was raised and educated in Old Crow, the most northerly community in the Yukon. She's a citizen of the Gwich'in First Nation and a member of the Wolf Clan. She gained her depth in traditional scientific and ecological knowledge in Old Crow Flats, where her grandfather, mother, and the land were the bearers of this invaluable ancient knowledge which was passed on to Norma at a very young age. Encouraged by her elders, Norma entered politics shortly after leaving school. In 1985, Norma was elected to Yukon's Legislative Assembly as member for Gwich'in First Nation, a position she held until 1992. 
During this time, Norma was selected by the elders of Gwich'in Nation to act as a spokesperson on behalf of the Gwich'in people for the preservation of the porcupine caribou herd. From 95 to 98, Norma was the environmental manager for the Council of Yukon First Nations. In this capacity, she headed the CYFN Northern Contaminants Program and was chair of the Center for Indigenous People, Nutrition and Environment at McGill University. In 2007, Norma co-founded the Arctic Institute of Community-Based Research and served as the Director of Indigenous Collaboration to May 2019 to promote community-based Northern-led research aimed at improving the lives of Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples of the North and promoting the health and their environments. In addition to her role as CMN Co-Research Director, Norma is an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Science at McGill University in Montreal where she has co-led community-based research and training initiatives focused on climate change adaptation. She also serves as senior advisor to the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, which advocates for Indigenous-led land use planning, guardians programs, and the creation of Indigenous protected areas. So yes, we have a power panel here, <laughs> definitely. So thank you again to everyone who is joining us for the second panel for International Mountain Day. I am excited to be here and really excited for the conversations that we're gonna be having about sustaining biocultural diversity of the mountain regions. Now, um, first I wanted to start with Norma. And Norma, I'm wondering if you can, um, kind of stir us off in a good way and just kind of talk about the two-eyed seeing approach that we discussed, of course, uh, in the last panel, but some people are joining us only for this panel. So I'm just wondering if you can just kind of briefly touch upon that to open up the conversation. Um, Norma, I think your mic is off. <laughs> Her famous words, your mic is off. time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I, I would really like to think about our el el uh, elder Albert Marshall, uh, who had really shed a lot of light on two-eyed seeing. And, and, uh, something that we have been for a long, long time wanting to do in research. Um, the way the elders speak about it and have educated about two-eyed seeing is that we are coming into a place in the world where young people are going to have to be, uh, to work together. Non like non-Aboriginals and academics working together going forward in uh, doing research and collaboration in all levels of what we need to do going forward in our economies, education, research, and all of that. And that's a strong direction from our elders with respect to two-eyed seeing, that those young people have to be prepared and given the skills. And in our way, we call it the pack sack of tools to go forward together and walk together because of the, the way of the environment and the way of um, the planet is today. So it's very important that um, the education of youth takes place in collaboration with Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth together. And I think that's really important. That will braid knowledge. They will do research together. They will work together. They will understand the history of indigenous peoples on this planet and what we are all about and what we are fighting for at all times so that we wouldn't come to this place we are on right now with, with, um, with Mother Earth. So it's, it's really important for them to work together and braid that knowledge together moving forward in all levels. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I would really like to go to Pam now and um, 
Pam, I'm wondering if you can start us off by reminding us of our key international biological and cultural diversity commitments stemming from the Convention on Biological Diversity, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and other key sources in recognition of International Mountain Day today, and its focus this year on biodiversity, and to speak how these obligations relate to mountain regions. Um, once again, this is the panel on sustaining the biocultural diversity of our mountain region. So we will be, again, grading the conversations from ind Indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing to the more scientific education-based approach. And um, Pam, I'm wondering if you can pick up the conversation on those notes. Um, thank you very much, Lisa. And I'll acknowledge first that I'm here uh, today on the unceded territory of Sinemic First Nation on the east side of Vancouver Island, about uh, mid-island, uh, for people looking for that, that uh, uh, reference to where are we in the world. And I and you know, I'll start talking about the United Nations, which uh, you know, perhaps seems like a very colonial, large-scale world structure to be talking about here, but it uh, it ties so well, uh, the, specifically talking about the Sustainable Development Goals, the, the 17 goals, 169 targets, over 5,000 actions, uh, ties so well to what Norma talked about this morning in that we are all interconnected, uh, that we all tie together. Uh, Catherine as well talked about we're all here together on the planet. A number of the presenters this morning talked about uh, just how, how nothing can be separated. And I think at its core, that's what the sustainable development goals are all about, that you, you can't talk about social issues in isolation of economics and environmental impacts. You can't talk about um, cultural um, in, in impacts that you're having on cultural practices without also talking about other sectors. So that's what the sustainable development goals are all about, is, is pulling all those ideas together under 17 headings, uh, for sure. Some are more applicable to mountain environments perhaps than others. So uh, the perhaps easy obvious one is number 15, life on land, maybe life below water, number 14. Uh, we might have to sort of scratch our heads a bit to think how do some of the other goals directly apply to mountain environments, but they do because it's all connected. Uh, we, are, we are all uh, pulling together. So life on land does tie to goal five, gender equality. It does tie to quality education. Again, to what Norma was just talking about, about uh, we're learning from each other and really understanding and really hearing. And we can't talk about life on land um, as a goal without talking about education um, and learning. We can't talk about gender equality and thinking about how uh, economies unfold in mountain environments and the um, horrific uh, uh, impacts that uh, that economies have had on mountain environments in the back, but also on, on that, that also coming at it from a question of gender equality. So it's these layers and layers of understanding that all fit together in the sustainable development goals that I think make it a, a really good framework uh, for us to, to talk about uh, when we're talking about uh, learning together, uh, working together, uh, taking this, this graded approach uh, to moving forward. So I think it's important. The, the other reason it's important for uh, the work that we are doing on the Mount Taro Smith Biosphere region. Uh, we are a UNESCO designated region. We are one of 18 biosphere reserves in Canada. And I do very carefully use the term biosphere region uh, in reference to Mount Taro Smith uh, because, uh, because of uh, comments from our Indigenous partners um, at the table, at our round table, uh, one of the comments that was raised was this idea of biosphere reserves, this UNESCO senior government uh, designated land designation, another imposition on the landscape, um, the use of the word reserve was problematic uh, for it. So uh, through careful discussions, through um, um, trying to find a better way of going forward, uh, we are now the Mount Terrell Smith Biosphere region. Uh, and it uh, very much is in recognition of the, the loads, loaded meaning of the word reserve in a Canadian legal context. Um, and also because it's, it's the area is not a reserve, it's not a preserve uh, by any, any stretch of the imagination, but it is a region. And so it recognizes uh, a number of issues that were attached to a terminology uh, to give better recognition to the first peoples of this area and their feelings about uh, place and space uh, and language. So, so all those things tying together. So it's getting back to your original question. 
Uh, why are the SDGs important to this discussion it is back to that idea that we are all connected, all together on this planet. Um, ultimately, here's a you know, scientific fact, water runs downhill. And so whatever's happening in mountain regions is affecting everything that's happening uh, below that mountain region. And so that's why uh, using the SDGs of, as a framework for um, research going forward, I think is a, an important part of this discussion. Fantastic, thank you so much for that. Um, I just wanted to remind our uh, participants, our delegates here today that we are going to have a Q&A at the end and you're welcome to put in your questions in the chat so that we can address them at the end. I know I'm sure everyone's minds are sparked about a hundred ways with the conversations we've already had during this panel. So we look forward to um, addressing your questions and specific um, topics that you want to be covered in greater depth near the end. Um, so I wanted to go to Eli now and um, ask him about the understanding of Kuas in the New Chalmers language and how that understanding can inform the relationship building that is needed today for what Eli has described as this renaissance of peace and friendship today. Um, just a side note, this the renaissance of peace and friendship really kind of speaks very Age of Aquarius to me, so <laughs> I'm not sure if that's where you got it, but I, I like this idea very much. So Eli, can you expand on that knowledge about everything that's run from the new Chalmers perspective? Yeah, thanks, uh, Lisa. And first of all, happy Mountain Day to everybody. Um, that's what this is all about, right? Um, <clears throat> One thing I'll say in answering the question about Kuas um, is as, as New Channel peoples, uh, it means all along the, the mountains, you know, the mountain range of Vancouver Island on the west, westward side, down out into the ocean, were New Channel peoples um, all along the coast. And so, um, <clears throat> and, you know, uh, this concept of Kuas, it, it's, uh, you know, I mean, I think for some people it might it might come off as uh, as an interesting insight into an indigenous culture, um, but for for myself, it's it has much more profound implications in the way that we think about what is the good life, uh, what what makes a life worth living. Some of the questions that have been asked for many uh, thousands of years, what uh, what determines success. What can we consider success and um, or opportunity? And I'm kind of rifting off uh, questions that were asked earlier about perspectives on mountains, whether this is uh, whether whether you look at a mountain as a sacred place or whether you look at it as a commodity and an opportunity. Um, so when we get into concepts of humanity, we start to get into that unspoken um, knowledge that we, we educate our children, we, we socialize them over time. And uh, unfortunately, in modern society, in North American society, human beings are kind of slated into a few different categories. The one that's most uh, relevant is consumers. We are all consumers. Um, from a New Channel worldview, um, kuas means real life human being, real as imagined, real as opposed to imagined or dreamt, um, live as opposed to unborn or deceased, and human as as opposed to all the other creatures in 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 this world. Um, and this humanity concept has many chapters of teachings. It has. Uh, substructure of understanding um, that have been derived over many uh, millennia of experience and in contemplating the nature of reality, the nature of humanity and the interconnection of humanity with all things. You know, you, you said, uh, by the way, Lisa, that was one of the most beautiful readings of my bio I've ever heard. It's 10 year, it was 10 years out of date um, but that's still, you got the he shook ish in there. 
So what I'm talking about here is how does the concept of, of kuas, our understanding of humanity, inform how we interrelate with all things? This idea of he shook ish tzawak, or he shook nish tzawak. We are all we are all one. We are all interconnected. And um, so the the next one, and you know, I'm not, I'm certainly not. A, although I'm already a grandfather, which was part of the bio update. I've got two grandchildren, um, but uh, but I'm certainly not a a cultural leader of any sort in my own community or what have you. I mean, we have those people who do that. I'm just a student in that world. Uh, but from the teachers that I've had, uh, what I've learned is that our concept of humanity uh, has this, uh, the next one is that we are, uh, as, as Kuas, we are a link between our past ancestors and our future ancestors. And as a link between the past and the future, we have a responsibility to manage our, our inheritance with care. And our inheritance includes all of our the natural wealth that we have inherited, including our own natural selves, but it also includes our intellectual wealth, intangible wealth in our language, in our names, in our songs. And that, that is something that we caretake, we um, temporarily, for our future ancestors. And so from this cultural logic arises um, an understanding of natural law as it pertains to humanity. So that by the very understanding of who I am as kuas, as a human being, um, that I also understand that I have an, a built-in inherent intergenerational accountability that is that that is quintessentially human, that, that defines my humanity. And recognizing that I'm only here for a very short period of time uh, on this earth in, in this current form. And so um, this, is, uh, this humanity concept is not only important for understanding our philosophical understanding of ourselves and our interconnection of all things, but in a modern day time, it's in particularly important and I'll share my own personal story and then I'll be quiet and let the, the panel proceed. Um, and how the term kuas was medicine in my life. Um, I was born on the west coast of Vancouver Island and I grew up back and forth between the prairies and the west coast. And when I was in, you know, growing up in Manitoba, um, you know, and being half Dutch Mennonite, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes, family on my mom's side and then half New Channel. Um, you know, and I was educated as a young child of, of who I am, but, uh, you know, growing up and, and being exposed to uh, racism and whatnot and concepts, state, state driven concepts or societal driven concepts of who I am, I'm a mixed blood or I'm a 6'2 by the legal quantum of the Indian Act, um, I'm a native Aboriginal Indian First Nations Indigenous there's all of these terms that are put on to us. And, um, and what, my, what my teacher taught me is that he, he said to me, Eli, you're none of those things that society labels upon you. You are a kuas, real live human being. And it was very, it was, a, it was a great medicine for my life in my early 20s when I, when I was given that teaching about humanity because I was dealing with my own identity struggle uh, within this complex world of, you know, racism and, and different things like that. And I'll say this in concluding that the humanity concept was absolutely pivotal in all of the work that we did that I that I had the opportunity to participate in um, through the tribal parks effort of my own nation in Tlaoquiet, um, in how we interacted with agents of the crown, how we interacted with local civil society organizations, academia, private sector, so on and so forth, that we started with a prayer and, and gathering the, the unborn future and past generations together. And, uh, and then we talk about our common ground, which is that humanity. So I'll stop there, Lisa. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. And again, happy Mountain Day to everybody. Looking forward to the dialogue.
Thank you so much, Eli, for um, sharing your perspectives on interconnectedness from the New Chalmers perspective and also your personal story. Um, that's so greatly appreciated and very grounding. Um, I'd like to turn to Norma now to discuss a little bit more about the Guardians program, which is briefly mentioned um, prior in your bio, and I just was hoping that you could expand upon that in relation to the topic today of biocultural diversity of mountain um, regions, and do you see the Indigenous Guardians program becoming an important mechanism for First Nations conservation involvement? And I already, I'm asking the question, I already know your answer for that. So I'll just go on, of course it is. Um, and so is there a focus from this project on how to support prog programs like this? Uh, yes, first of all, I just wanna say that uh, I, I um, Stephen Nita is just an awesome presenter and Unfortunately, he couldn't make it today. So I wanna read an excerpt out of his presentation to, to the US, um, not the US, the, uh, um, the Canadian Senate yes, yesterday afternoon. If you could allow me to do that, just in his honor, I would like to do that. He said, what, he said experts around the world, sorry. It's, Please there, go ahead, I'm very excited oh, to hear okay, this. Okay. <laughs> okay, he said, experts around the world agree biodiversity loss is, is accelerating at an unprecedented rates and biodiversity loss affects our climate just as climate change affects our lands and waters. Studies show that lands and nature managed by indigenous peoples and local communities contain most of the globe's remaining biodiversity. These values exist on Indigenous lands because they are stewarded by Indigenous peoples, land guardians. We bring unique knowledge and millennia of experience in managing these areas. Canada has recently announced that it will protect 25% of the lands and waters by 2025 and 30% by 2030. As the Prime Minister recently acknowledged, Indigenous par partnerships are essential to achieving these goals. In fact, Canada can only meet these targets by putting Indigenous-led conservation, land use planning, Indigenous protected conserved areas, and Indigenous stewardship and guardianship programs at the very heart of its nature conservation strategy. We are already working together and leading the way in helping Canada to achieve its biodiversity conservation targets. The vast majority of new protected areas in recent years have been designed and established and managed by and with indigenous communities. So that Stephen Nitas, I took that message out of his presentation yesterday, just because he's he's supposed to be in my place, which would have been awesome too, but I hope he's feeling better. Um, and, and with your question, land guardians are growing across the country. Uh, it was a huge um, endeavor that started in Australia it, it, it started also in Panama and it's now working its way uh, across Canada in a very incredible way. So um, basically what's going on there is indigenous, young indigenous peoples, men and women are being trained by indigenous knowledge from their own peoples in their own homelands on how to conserve our biodiversity within our areas, in our spaces. And they're also trained by biological science as well in collaboration. And these young people are the eyes and ears on the ground looking after these territories. And as they work the land and walk in those forests and walk along the riverbeds and in the wetlands, the animals become alive. And, and it's really phenomenal the way they interact. They watch the climatic changes out there they bring home the messages that they see about the animals. Are they healthy? Are they doing okay? What did they look like? They bring that message back to the communities, to the elders, have a discussion. And as a result, it's, it's um, tr more stronger laws of indigenous conservation are coming out in these areas where there are land guardians. And it's, it's absolutely incredible. And we would like to really push that campaign and move that campaign into the rest of the world for sustainability. 
like areas like such as um, Guatemala, Peru, Chile, Australia, Brazil, places like that, people are still um, being massacred and killed for stepping all forward to to fight for their biodiversity. And you know, this is this kind of thing has got to stop. We also need to be at the table with the United Nations, UNESCO, IUCN, and those organizations as, as indigenous peoples right up front, like immediately actually. And we need to be recognized for that. Um, and also our research. Our research will be absolutely important um, going forward um, in all of this. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to, to speak to those issues um, as well in all of this in, uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much for sharing those words from Stephen as well, who of course couldn't be here today. That is uh, an amazing excerpt and really builds the conversation moving forward. Um, now I wanted to, um, build on what you had just mentioned about having Indigenous people at the table with um, within multiple organizations and within research and within on the land um, guardians work. And Pam, I'm wondering um, if I can get your perspective here because you've done a lot of work with UNESCO Biosphere Reserves as the research director of the UNESCO Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Research Institute, and you were the senior editor of the International Journal of UNESCO Biosphere Reserves. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you could first sort of expand on your experience on having Indigenous participation and knowledge within um, those realms and maybe some key takeaways that you have from from those experiences. Um, thanks, Lisa. Uh, okay, so the, uh, the Mount Charles Smith Bossier Region Research Institute, uh, um, our research agenda comes from the members of the Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Region Roundtable. And so this is the roundtable that is the governance body for the Biosphere Reserve, one of in 18 of these uh, entities across Canada. So it's a very different kind of governance structure. Uh, it's um, Sonema First Nation, uh, Snowdonis First Nation, Qualcomm First Nation, Vancouver Island University, Town of Qualcomm Beach, City of Parksville, uh, local tourism association, local chamber of commerce, uh, the, uh, forestry company uh, that owns about 90% of the land base that is in the biosphere uh, region as well. And so we, we sit around a round table as partners. And in the center of the table are the, the common, it's the common purpose of biosphere reserves, which is conservation, sustainable development and research and education. And so that's that's the common purpose that holds us all together. So it's it's not an organ, there's no hierarchy, there's not a membership, there's not a, a fee to be involved. We're all sitting around this table because uh, we recognize there's something very special and fragile about this place and particularly about mountain environments that, that everyone who's at the table cares about. So that, that holds us together. The partners, uh, sitting around the round table are the ones who say, uh, here's what the issues are that are important to this community. So it, the Research Institute works very much on community-based applied research with the questions created by the partners at the table. So we work with uh, Snowdonis First Nation, Qualcomm First Nation, uh, Snowmook First Nation on a variety of projects that are, it's not, um, I guess I would liken it to, it's not uh, uh, perhaps a traditional form of academic research where I come up with a question that I'm interested in and then I proceed with my, my research in whatever way um, I see fit. I don't involve a local community. I'm not working with the First Peoples um, of that place. You know, in this, this kind of more traditional academic approach, we are, we're trying, we are working very hard to completely flip that narrative. And so every project is working with uh, one of the speakers this morning mentioned as well, the idea of uh, for uh, working with um, First Nation communities for us on, on Vancouver Island, uh, know about us without us. So that no project proceeds without a partnership. And if that partnership isn't in place, then the project doesn't proceed. Um, that's, that's what it is. It's then perhaps that's a, maybe it's a project for another day or maybe it doesn't happen at all. Uh, that's, that's the approach that we are taking. And so uh, why, why I think it's so important, and Norma, you touched on it, is that it really does tie uh, to education and 
And my one first agenda is to get students involved in education, uh, working in partnership uh, with Indigenous communities, uh, bringing, uh, bringing that bright-eyed, bushy-tailed energy of students uh, and all their, um, you know, all their, their enthusiasm and energy to get things done. But also, they're working on things that are important and of interest uh, to our partners on the project, to our Indigenous partners or our community partners. And so, it, uh, you know, ultimately, what we're doing is create creating students that are going to be better citizens in the world that see themselves as part of a planet that understand you know there is there's 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 one planet there's one ocean and we're all in this together as the speakers talked about this morning and the more work we can do on that community-based applied research approach uh, hanging on to our, our touchstones in the center of the table of, of conservation and sustainable development um, then we're, we're all going to be better off uh, because of it so it's it's very much embedded into the uh, the DNA of, of all the work we do. And I'm, you know, I'm excited um, to see where we go uh, with this work and how, um, you know, how partnerships develop, how we all become better uh, at, at working together. Fantastic, thank you for sharing that. Um, I like those ideas of the common pillars in between everyone that's around the table. That's such a beautiful concept and a really great visual capture for us all to be able to understand that, um, the approach so easily, thank you. Um, so I wanna to turn to Eli, back to Eli now um, to expand upon this idea about um, indigenous protected and conserved areas. Um, now, Eli, I know you have experience in working to develop and establish and oversee these IPCAs. And I'm wondering if you can uh, talk about how these areas not only conserve biodiversity, but are sites in which the relationship between indigenous peoples and Canada as a whole can be changed, in which the self-determination of indigenous peoples can be enacted. Mm. Eli, can yeah, you share so. on that? What, what was that, Lisa? Sorry, there's just the anyways. anyways uh, I had a, I was wondering if you could talk about yeah, okay, um, sure. yeah. indigenous protected and conserved areas in your territory and your experience mm -hmm. in that and yeah. how yeah. those are used to assert sovereignty. I guess uh, a good starting point is to say that um, the erosion of biological diversity in Canada, as, as similar around the world, has gone hand in hand with the eradication of languages and cultures. And so there's a parallel extinction event happening. The extinction of languages and cultures and the extinction of biodiversity. And so IPCAs, generally, broadly speaking, offers an opportunity to correct course, uh, to look at the importance of Indigenous knowledge systems that have uh, crewed over millennia in properly governing and managing um, our, our territories, our lands. And so that, that one, I think, is a really key take home point. Um, and when you ask about the sovereignty side of things, um, what I'm reminded of is the quote from uh, late William Commanda, which is that we exercise our rights through taking care of our responsibilities. And so IPCAs is very much in that vein of taking responsibility. It's not so much about asserting rights. Rights are important. Um, the conversation about rights has happened um, and it is a very important uh, conversation. The elders have told me that we have to look at our responsibilities. They say that, you know, rights and responsibilities are two sides of the same coin. And so uh, when we talk about sovereignty or exercising jurisdiction, what often comes to my mind is this indigenous concept of a grandmother's authority. So in many indigenous societies, as, as well as non-indigenous societies, maybe in, to different degrees, um, grandmothers hold a particular position of, of authority in the family. Um, and she has a unique 
just like the mother bear in the channel in our in our law system the the bear represents that that taking care of responsibilities the the mother bear because she has her boundaries she has her boundaries and you know what we know that if you are in the forest and you see a baby bear you know that mama bear is nearby and she in her boundary extends to her children her babies and her grandchildren and so the grandmother's authority is one of responsibility that uh, she ultimately has the responsibility for the well-being of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And so if, uh, if her children and grandchildren are coming within harm's way, um, that she has the, the uh, authority to intervene with a, with a firm but loving hand. Now, I use those words very intentionally because sometimes that uh, intervention might mean uh, smack upside the head for, you know, her son or child that's not, uh, you know, that's lost sight of what's most important. But, but she will not lose sight of that. And so um, when I think of sovereignty as, as um, as described to me by elders when we're talking about indigenous protected and conserved areas, that's what I think of. And in terms of ushering in a renaissance and peace and friendship, what I want to say about that is I want to acknowledge our Wallistic way uh, sisters and brothers out in the east, um, Eastern Gate. Um, there's a poster on the wall of the Maliseet Conservation Council in Fredericton that has really stayed with me, an image on that poster. And it's a circle that's divided into four quadrants and it represents time. It's a temporal depiction, a visual to, to, um, depiction of time. Um, and the first quadrant is of first contact and that early indigenous diplomacy that happened the diplomacy by our people when, when welcoming a new, a new peoples who, let's remember, were dependent upon our people. When they first arrived, there was a cultural logic that was in place that could, that could receive these newcomers. And, um, and that was the era of diplomacy, indigenous diplomacy. The second quadrant uh, next is the era of treaty making. And let's bear in mind also that um, the Wallistic Way and other indigenous peoples, the Haudenosaunee and others who were um, key actors in the early days of um, geopolitical formations in North America with the, the French Canadian, the French British War, the, the war, the Seven Years War um, and the War of 1812, that um, during that time there was a well-established pre-existing uh, heritage of treaty making. Um, and that's probably obvious to many of you, but maybe is new to some of you, which is that King George and other um, uh, European um, state or kingdom heads of state, um, they were welcomed into this treaty making tradition that was for many of our people observed in mother nature's interactions, the, the way that different species coexist um, in deriving teachings and principles of relationship from those observations. Um, so that's the second quadrant of relationship. The third is treaty denial. And this is kind of the dark age of our relationship where those early peace and friendship treaties were uh, run roughshod over, um, misused and abused. Uh, this era of treaty denial and then the, the last is an era of treaty litigation, which is very much, a, you know, very much appropriate considering the adversarial nature of Canadian judicial systems. The court systems by their very nature are adversarial. Political negotiations that we participate in with the state are by their very nature adversarial. And so um, this, this, this fourth quadrant on this poster at the Maliseet Conservation Council um, office in Fredericton talks about treaty litigation. And what I see now is that we are collectively, because many of the prophecies are, you know, the predictions that were made, you know, I heard it from 
um, the Gwich'in, I heard it from the Wallistic Way, I heard it from my own new channel of peoples, our elders, that the elders who are alive at the time of first contact observe the behavior and the attitudes of the newcomers, their insatiability and, and um, in incredible uh, capacity to consume and, and liquidate natural resources. Uh, they predicted at that time that things would get very bad. Things would get to the brink of total destruction where the fragility of the environment wasn't the problem, it's the fragility of our human systems and our human existence that's, that's at stake here. And uh, they predicted that at, when things were beyond, almost looking beyond repair is that the great grandchildren of the newcomers will come to our great grandchildren and they will ask for guidance and support and help to see our way collectively out of this uh, man-made catastrophe. Um, and, and I believe that we are at that point now and many who I have spoken with uh, believe that we are at that point. I mean, the Canadian Mountain Network and this whole conversation about braiding knowledge systems for me is evidence that we are at that time. And, uh, and I believe that we need to add in another quadrant and come full circle, in fact, to a new era of indigenous diplomacy where we can, you know, and this is where the idea of ushering in a new era of peace and friendship comes in. The last, the last thing I'll say on that, Lisa, is that um, these pe peace and friendship treaties have often been looked at as um, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, from, from some perspectives that uh, it was trickery or that um, it is uh, tokenism or it's just a fluff. And, um, but the teachings that I have from the elders that I've had the opportunity to learn from is that peace and friendship is akin to the notion of positive peace. Positive peace is uh, versus negative peace. Positive peace is the, not just the absence of war and conflict, but positive peace is the presence of justice and good relations. And what some of our, some of our um, folks call Zagindawin, and I'm kind of drawing from a, a teaching from Dr. John Burroughs that I had, I had received about abundance and love. And that um, in these peace and friendship treaties were sophisticated ideas of bioregional economics and peaceful commerce, as well as collective security which the United States of America founding fathers tried to emulate in their, in their, um, in their uh, independence from the crown and this notion of collective security among many states. Um, and the Haudenosaunee Confederation uh, brought that concept to them as well as others. But uh, I just don't wanna stray too far from the point that you know, we're talking about very uh, simple but elegant understandings of relationship that are designed to stand the test of time as long as we continually reinvest in those relationships. And the Thayendanegas of uh, the, the, the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte said this very eloquently in their letter to the Crown last year, which was read openly earlier in 2020 when the blockades were rampant, which is that we have to get together and polish the silver covenant chain to, um, to keep our relationship bright and new when from time to time it becomes tarnished. So I'll end there and thank you so much for the question, Lisa. Fantastic, thank you for sharing those four quadrants and that uh, sign. It's so amazing how you can see something so simple as a poster in an office that can, um, actually teach you so much and help you expand upon the knowledge that you already have. Um, I do think that there needs to be another um, quadrant or uh, not another quadrant, but another um, offshoot to that so we can get post treaty. That's just my personal belief. <laughs> but I uh, love the idea of unity and everyone coming together um, from like, from a human perspective, not an indigenous and a non-indigenous perspective, but like just a human perspective coming together for the goodness of all. Um, I really do hope that we're 
really moving in that direction in such a good way. I actually want to bring in Miles Richardson right now because we did have that discussion about treaties briefly there. And uh, Miles, of course, has an experience with experience with the Treaty Commission in British Columbia. And just wondering if you can kind of touch upon those um, relationships and how we can move forward to um, to use those um, for the betterment of all to sustain our biocultural diversity in mountain regions, but also the environment as a whole and asserting sovereignty. So just a small question there for him. Well, I, I've, I've always thought like Eli has been articulating that, um, well, maybe I shouldn't put words in Eli's mouth, but I've, I've always thought that given that Indigenous people who've always been here in the Crown Canada are here, given that we're all here to stay in the future, we've got to figure out how to get along. And sovereignty and jurisdiction, both to Indigenous people and the Crown are important. And we need to sort that out. You know, we need to figure out who's gonna, who's gonna have be responsible for what, and who's gonna have what authority. That's the essence of treaty making. So we need to address that in a good way. But as we do that, you know, as human beings, indigenous people, th through our way of knowing, have responsibilities that are an essential part of who we are responsibilities in our territories. As Eli is saying, when I, as a young Haida leader, that's the first thing my elders said to our generation is what we've been doing for 150 years isn't working. Going to the crown, asking for justice, asking them to give us justice in their way. We know that as a living generation of, of an ancient nation, we have responsibilities. We have responsibilities to our past ancestors. We have responsibilities to the future. And if we're gonna survive, if we're gonna be who we are, we need to shoulder those responsibilities. And that's where initiatives like we're talking about today, like land and marine use planning, indigenous led land and marine use planning, where guardians efforts and guardians of authorizing initiatives and that's like the Tunaha initiative, you know, just standing up and carrying out their responsibilities to protect the grizzly bear spirit. You go over to the prairies, you see the Buffalo treaties, you know, you'll come back to the coast of BC and you see all the nations working together to protect indigenous knowledge around herring, the base of the fo marine food chain. You know, you go up north and see all the efforts Norma and her people have been doing, as have the Innu, as have the Casca and in to, more toward the coast to protect their responsibilities and relationships with the caribou. That's at the essence of it. And asserting our sovereignty through responsibility is the proper perspective. And if we do that in a good way with proper ceremony and, and challenging all others, in this case, the crown, to live up to their, their standards based on the truth, we're gonna get there. And it begins with dialogue. Dialogue, respectful dialogue is so important. Um, that's what reconciling ways of knowing initially advocated. And this is the dialogue we're engaged in and we're, expecting that that's gonna lead to a, a meeting of the minds and even come up with some policy um, direction that's gonna help us to deal with some of these huge challenges we have in front of us. Climate change, biodiversity loss, all those things. And, it, and, you know, it, it, and that's the essence of treaty making. It's a process. It's not just an event. Absolutely. Thank you so much for building upon that knowledge, Miles. Um, 
I kind of want to bring this back to the conversation about biocultural diversity specifically and want to kind of round out the conversation with um, some of the UN initiatives. So we're going to go back to Pam to um, expand upon uh, how the UNESCO biosphere reserves and that designation really helped protect biodiversity and also sort of building upon that knowledge of treaty and Canada and the relationship. What is Canada's role right now to maintain its obligation in regards to those de designations? Yeah, it's such a big question. So um, there's the 18 biosphere reserves across Canada and they're all very different. So there's two in British Columbia. Uh, one is Mount Aerosmith on the east side of the island. The other is our, our more famous sister, uh, Clayquot uh, Biosphere Reserve on the west side of the island. So it, uh, um, ours is, um, our biosphere is, is over 90% privately owned land. Uh, Clayquot uh, Sound is, is uh, roughly the equivalent of the Pacific Rim National Park. And so it's uh, two very different places uh, for the other biosphere reserves across Canada are very different places. but. You know, Canada is part of that partnership uh, working with the United Nations that, that designates these very special places. And, you know, so there's something special and important about this place in the Earth's surface. So uh, I would say that's, that's one of the initiatives Canada has. But Eli's touched on one that's so critically important is the commitment that Canada has made to protected and conserved areas, the 30% by 2030. So, so the federal government has made a commitment around this, this, um, you know, this number that we've uh, pronounced a number, um, not unlike the, the carbon emission uh, commitments that the federal government makes or, or, or others around the climate crisis that the federal government might make, but uh, um, the one that Eli was just talking about, the 30% by 2030 cannot be achieved, and the federal government has, has, has come out and said we cannot achieve this without uh, real partnerships with Indigenous peoples from across Canada. And so uh, so, you know, I, I think sometimes we might be, uh, you know, perhaps feeling a little cynical about it that we set these targets. We have you know, 17 sustainable development goals and the, you know, over 5,000 actions. And, and you, know, it's, you know, perhaps sometimes we might um, well, say, well, I don't see how this applies uh, to me as an individual or to my organization or to my, you know, to my family, to this uh, place where I am. But it's, uh, but it's all of, it's all of these things. It's, it's you know, setting out. Um, great lofty ideas and then finding a way to work toward them. And so um, Eli, Eli and I are, are working together right now, um, actually on education around indigenous uh, protected and conserved areas, uh, specifically intended for students, of course, but people who are working uh, in this area across Canada so that we actually, you know, potentially we could achieve this 30% by 2030. If we are all, uh, if we raise the level of knowledge about this particular area, if we all work together, um, what could happen? You know, the, am the amazing, powerful action that could happen if we're all pulling in the same direction. So, um, Eli, I don't know if you have any other comments around uh, education in, in this particular area. Yeah, so we're, thanks, Pam, we're developing the IPCA planning certificate um, at uh, the Vancouver Island University and the mm -hmm. Um, planning program that Pam leads and um, you know we're and that's part of the bigger conservation through reconciliation partnership but certainly um, you know like through the ice process we identified the four moose the four moose in the room and one of them was around capacity development and uh, and so that we don't end up with um, stranded assets and that we look at um, what are the needs of the community in order to be able to uh, truly, you know, you know, be self-determining. So, um, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you both for adding to that conversation. Um, I have a comment here from, or a comment or a question rather from the, from a participant, and this is directed towards Pam, and this kind of steers the conversation in a little bit of a different way, but I think is really powerful. Uh, personal grounded way. Um, so Noella asks or says this that a word that comes up for me in listening to the powerful speakers and panelists is well being. Is well being discussed at the quote unquote table? Well being of self, 
family, community, well-being of relationships to each other, the land, the animals, to knowledge systems, and core to healing paths. Is well-being part of the language of these projects? And so projects is sort of a broad term here, but normally you have such a um, a web <laughs> of knowledge and outreach in many different projects in many different areas um, from all across Canada. And I'm just wondering if you can um, expand upon that, like if these yeah, core could, well, teachings uh, and yeah, to the is uh, to Noel. I think that's uh, who's asked the question. It is goal um, sustainable development goal number three is good health and well being. So it uh, you know again we're we're coming back to this this very holistic uh, perspective. Um, it it um, so informed by the sustainable development goals. But I mean ultimately that we're we're talking all of those goals relate to the idea of well being. It is a foundational idea um, that it has to be. Uh, well-being of, of people, of the planet, uh, of prosperity, of place, of partnerships, um, the well-being of all, all of those five key areas that help to shape the sustainable development goals, that's, that's what holds us all together. So we can't, um, we can't be sick in one area um, and say that we're doing well in any other area. So we can't, uh, we can't have you know, sickness in relationships among people and say, oh, you know, but we're doing okay on Peace. I think mean, it's, it's impossible for those two statements to be true. And so yeah, I think Noelle's hit on something really important about that. That is that foundational uh, element that perhaps pulls us all together is this idea of, of, of it has to be well-being for all and for everything, for every aspect of it. So it, uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful idea of how do we, how do we do, um, how do we do better on every front at the same time? Uh, and, and pull forward. And I, I agree with Eli. I think we're at a, a time of um, when you know, perhaps more things are possible than um, may have been true in the past. Great, thank you. Um, so quickly, I just wanted to go to Norma to um, comment on that last question as well. If there's any um, any sort of succinct statements that you have regarding that idea of well-being. Yes, I do. Um, for every, for in my culture, and I think it's uh, in relation to many indigenous cultures, um, our main existence and the paths that are chosen or we choose are going to have relevancy for the future generations. We're always thinking several generations ahead in the work that we do no matter what kind of work we choose. It's, it's, um, it's part of, uh, in, in the way I was raised, that it was to be always keeping several generations ahead of your children. And they too will, con when, will continue that circle for well-being in every area of their existence. Um, also, we come from a basis of four directions, earth, air, fire, and water the most intricate um, parts of our planet, elements of our planet. And tied into that is our well-being emotionally, physically, spiritually, and mentally. And if she is not well in those four areas, either one of them, earth, air, fire, and water, then we are not well um, as peoples. So um, it's a uh, that thinking is ingrained in us in our language well in my language anyways and how we do things so very much so um everything that we talk about and things that we do is very much about well-being um, of our younger people our elders about the community our planet um, our biodiversity our animals Fantastic. Thank you so much for bringing that forward. Um, so I'd like to turn, we're just getting to the end of the panel here, and I'd like to turn to Dr. Murray Humphreys, um, who is the convener for the Canadian Mountain Network to um, bring a few closing notes to this panel um, as one of the two organizations that came forward for the panel today. So um, Dr. Humphreys. Thanks very much. 
I'm pleased to be able to offer a few closing remarks as co-research director of the Canadian Mountain Network. Uh, on this International Mountain Day, I'm connecting to this event from McGill University in Montreal, situated on the traditional territory of the Kenya Kehaka. Um, on this International Mountain Day, we recognize that mountains are defined by diversity, a diversity of topography, a diversity of physical landforms, a diversity of ice and snow and water, a diversity of wildlife, and a diversity of people's knowledges and livelihoods. Wherever they occur, mountains are diverse and place-based research and place-based knowledge brings all that diversity, complexity, and connectivity into clearer view. Uh, the Canadian Mountain Network supports the resilience and health of Canada's mountain peoples uh, and places through research partnerships based on Indigenous and Western ways of knowing that inform decision-making and action. And together with the Canadian Mountain Assessment and Reconciling Ways of Knowing, we hope that we're on the cusp of what Eli Ann's just suggested a few minutes ago might be a new quadrant, uh, an opportunity for positive peace, focused on advancing Indigenous-led research in multiple ways of knowing uh, at a time when Canadians, uh, Canada's mountain systems are undergoing rapid and uncertain change. So it's an opportunity and a challenge that's bigger than a mountain um, and depends on all of us and our ability to learn together well. So I want to thank all the panelists sincerely for the guidance and the insight they've offered us today and hope that, that we at the Canadian Mountain Network can embody these principles and approaches across our network. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Humphreys, for those words. I'd also like to invite Miles Richardson to um, bring a few closing words as well to this panel. Miles? Perhaps Miles isn't here right now. Miles, if you are here. Oh, sorry, I, I was um, muted. Thank you, Lisa. Oh. And I just wanted to thank Dr. Humphreys and Norma and, and all the other um, Canadian Mountain Network participants, Eli, um, in, in convening, coming together for this important panel today and, and continuing this important dialogue on International Mountain Day focused on biodiversity. You know, some of the stories that we've shared and, and are sharing show that with, with respectful dialogue, with, with, with striving to understand the truth and basing our actions on that, that we can improve the way we live, the, the well-being of ourselves as, as human beings. And if we and if we do this with in proper ceremony, as our indigenous knowledge keepers keep reminding us and, and accept that we're all in this together, you know, as we've seen today, the sky's the limit. Just with, with respectful dialogue, with coming together and, and um, addressing these monumental challenges, man, climate change and biodiversity and the, the species loss are, are monumental challenges for humankind. And, and we've begun something really special in this process. And I, I thank the Canadian Mountain Network, wish you well in what you're doing and really looking forward to this dialogue, continuing the results that come out of it and, and continuing to to improve our lot as a human species. How are to all of you? Thank you. And thank you for a, a really great job of convening, Lisa. Janalia, thank you for everyone who's joined for this conversation today, this panel on bringing Indigenous knowledge and science together for International Mountain Day. So greatly appreciate it. And thank you to the panelists 
Norma Cassie, Eli Enns, Dr. Pamela Shaw, and also, of course, to Miles Richardson from Reconciled Ways of Knowing, and Dr. Murray Humphreys from the Canadian Mountain Network for being present today. And I want to give a big um, shout out to the team that's behind the scenes that you don't get to see, but that have been making everything happen today. They have been hard at work for a very long time, ensuring that everything runs uh, smooth and beautiful and we all get together here. So thank you, Jackie Miller, and to the other members of the Arkansas Ways of Knowing team. And also I want to um, acknowledge that although Stephen Nita wasn't able to be here with us today, he was here in spirit. Thank you, Norma, for bringing his words forward. Okay, so we are at a wrap for today. And thank you for celebrating International Mountain Day um, with us today. And so I think like, don't go out and hug a tree, maybe try go hugging a mountain today. <laughs> thank you. Good job. Thank you very much. So I'd like to take this opportunity to, to echo Lisa's kind words and thank everyone who made today possible. So Lisa, thank you very much for your amazing job serving as today's moderator. I'd also like to thank uh, Elder Ira Provost for helping us open today's dialogue in a, in a good way. And I will uh, invite him to help us close in that uh, same way in a few moments. I would like to uh, also thank him for sharing his vast experience during our, our first session today. Um, to Drs. Gray McDowell and Pam Shaw and Indigenous Knowledge Keepers, Catherine Tanise and Eli Enns, thank you very much for generously sharing all your knowledge and um, really allowing all of us to really engage in today's conversation and, and take a lot away from it. I would like to thank our conveners from the Reconciling Ways of Knowing Indigenous Knowledge and Science Forum and the Canadian Mountain Network. I'd also like to thank you know, the maestros of the uh, Reconciling Ways of Knowing team who helped make all the technology come together today. And most importantly, I'd like to thank everyone who was able to join us. It was uh, you who really made today's event a success. So I raise my hand to uh, all of you. I would like to thank our friends and the co-hosts today from the Canadian Mountain Network who invited us to join their celebration of International Mountain Day. The Canadian Mountain Network's tireless efforts support the resilience and health of Canada's mountain places and people through the research partnerships based on Indigenous and Western ways of knowing that inform decision-making and action. If you'd like to learn more about the Canadian Mountain Network, you can find it on their website at www canadianmountainnetwork.ca. We will be sending out a brief survey shortly. It would be greatly appreciated if you could take a few moments to share your thoughts with us. The Reconciling Ways of Knowing online forum series will be continuing into the coming months and new year. Please join us in January as we explore the role of spirituality in our connections with the land and each other. Additional information about this dialogue will be available shortly. If you haven't already done so, please visit our website at www.waysofknowingforum.ca to sign up for updates and follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. I would now like to invite Elder Ira Provost to help us close today's session and thank everyone very much. Um, good. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I just I want to um, first of all thank the reconciliation ways of knowing um, and uh, all the panelists for their comments, their stories, their learnings, their teachings. I've learned so much today, and I I, I truly take it to heart. Um, in the Blackfoot way of of um, of life of being, when you hear good words or you agree or you um, you accept something in good faith. Um, if someone says uh, you've done a good job or or gives you gratitude, you, you take it to your heart. And so with that, uh, I take all of your words to heart and, and thank you so much today for the, for the insight that you've all shared. Um, <clears throat> again, it's, it's been an absolute honor for me to bring blessings and bring 
uh, prayer today for for our our um, our table here, and I want to encourage you all to to look to your indigenous neighbors, look to your indigenous nations um, locally in your area to to understand who they are, understand their connections to the land, and understand that it um, it won't be a quick visit, nor should it be. Um, I really do want to applaud all those who helped put this day together and um, encourage you all to continue in a good way going forward. So I'll say, say a short Blackfoot prayer and then we'll, then I'll conclude. Greater, we come to you today, we give you gratitude, we give you strength, we give you honor for bringing us together today here in a good way. We pray that the words that we've, we've shared and we've spoken resonate with not just those who heard it, but those that we work with in our surroundings and our communities. And we also keep our, our youth and our elderly at home in, in in your care and your understanding to help us understand and to help us be strong in these challenging times. We pray for the work of the important work with our mountains and our environment to be strong and to continue on for generations to come. Thank you.